We're having another work session on the old uh, real chama. And uh, what I'm doing here really is putting the finishing screws in this balance because later on we want to direct some light back towards a, a little engaged town I'm building for a uh, scenic point that we'll discuss later on. You know, I started building the uh, Denver and Real Chama, my layout here, three or four years ago. And it sort of crept around the room and just taken up the whole thing. And the way all this began, I went up to Colorado. You see, I used to go up with my parents years ago when I was a kid, and many years ago when I was a kid. And we traveled up there, and uh, we'd stay at uh, dude ranches or whatever, or motels, and go out and check out the, the, the mountains and the scenery. So what I did, I got interested in photography, and I took my 35 millimeter camera up to Colorado and started documenting the scenic farms and the trees and the foliage. But you know, when I brought that stuff back home and put it on the old Kodak projector, it, it just wasn't enough. The two-dimensional image did not grab it for me. So I decided then that I would sculpt three-dimensionally a rendition, my rendition, my illustration of what Colorado is to me here in my garage. Now, you know, the thing that lends itself to the type of modeling that I do, which is this very vertical type uh, scenery form, is Colorado because uh, in this small space that I'm sitting in, uh, and my layout is in, uh, it's only nine feet across and maybe nine feet that way, so I didn't have a whole lot of room to play with when I started building my layout. And uh, so when I came back and started planning what I would do, I looked in the possibility of narrow gauge, and this is HON3, meaning that it's HO scale uh, with narrow gauge, you know, three foot spacing between the rails. And I could get a little bit more, you know, railroady atmosphere in a smaller area. And plus, I had the, the verticality working for me. Now, you know, looking at, at layout situations, what I did, I came back and, and I looked at what other people had done. I read books. I went to the hobby store and, and bought all these books on, uh, you know, uh, model railroads and bench work and scenery and things like that. And, and uh, I kind of just took the ideas of what everybody else had done, the pioneers in the hobby like John Allen and, and Lynn Westcott and people like that. And... Uh, read up on all that and sort of took the, the rules that they had used and laid down for model railroaders. And, and I looked at the rules merely as tools because, I mean, they're like hammers and screwdrivers and, and nails and, and uh, backhoes and diesel trucks and everything. I mean, you just take them and use them to form what you want to make. I mean, you don't have to be locked into any specific situation. That's what I'm trying to tell you because just like this layout here, I had to cram all this in and I had to bend the rules a little bit and mold rules to, uh, you know, make it all happen for me. And, and I want to stress to you, this is, this is really my illustration of what Colorado is to me. Now, that's what you want to do with the layout. You want to take the things that you like in model railroading or in scenery farms or whatever, uh, even if you're in the military modeling or whatever, you want to take what you personally like and sculpt and mold it into your illustration of what you perceive life to be or the world outside to be. And... Uh, it's fun. I mean, it reflects your personality and people learn who you are through your modeling. The, the thing is, it's, 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 uh, it's just a wonderful experience to be able to, to construct a layout such as this, and it is a personal experience. I've had people come in here and say, well, you know, uh, man, your, your mountains sure are vertical, or your trestles are too tall, or your rivers are too wide, or too skinny, or your trains are weird, or things like that. I mean, I don't worry about that because I built this layout for me, and that's what you want to do with your layout, build it for you. Because who do you ultimately have to please? Yourself, right? So, this first tape, we are going to touch on the basics. The basics are bench work, track laying, soldering, wiring. Things that get us to the skeletal form that is our basic situation. Now, after that, in a later tape, we're going to come back in our next tape and clothe our skeletal form with, you know, the scenery and the rocks and maybe put in a little engaged town like I'm doing here. And, and uh, what I was going to tell you before is that this engaged town is merely used as a forced perspective tool whereby the viewer comes into the room, he stands in the canyon, he sees the, the layout in front of him, and he looks back, and the little engaged town sort of forces the perspective and makes the distance seem greater. So I'm trying to expand visually my horizons here. And I've even put a mirror in the back of the canyon. But see, we can talk about all these things in our next tape. But, and we're going to do a little bit of mock-up scenery uh, type instances here on this first tape along with our bench work because even though we're doing the basics like you know uh, El Grotter bench work and track lane we want to start thinking about scenery early on because you know the, the form that our bench work takes is going to ultimately help determine what our three-dimensional scenery is going to look like so why don't we gather up our tools 
you know, our screwdrivers and our hammers and our saws and all that stuff there and put them in a little bag, head up to the studio and see if we can build ourselves a little bit of L girder. Upstairs. Let's go upstairs to the studio. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I forgot my tools. Let's go get the tools. All right, now, let's look. I need the saw. Definitely need the saw. I'm gonna sit over here. The gloves I do not need. I need the level because we're gonna do some benchmark. I need the drill. I gotta have the drill. I need catch out. I love catch out. I love catch out. And I love my pliers that I've been looking for for six months. I need these. Okay. I need I need this. I need the drill. I need the saber saw, plywood, you know, plywood telephone. They are charging me for the phone. I don't need the phone. Toss the phone. Screwdriver. For those people that like slot screws. Okay, let's head on upstairs. Here we go. Let's go on up there. Let's see if I can get all this. Maggie, can you carry some of this stuff? Let's head on up. Okay, here we go. Here we go. We're gonna go on upstairs. Come on, Maggie. Come on. Come on. Let's go on upstairs. Come on. I'm gonna set this down because I can't carry everything. Okay, let's go on up. Now to get the door open. Hold it. Okay, let's go in. Come on. Let's go. Up. Okay. Wait a minute, Maggie. I gotta get my saw. Come on. Get the saw. Okay, come on, Maggie. Let's go in. What this room really is is sort of my uh, escape. You know, as you look around the room, uh, it, it, it's what I term organized chaos. I mean, I am not one to put everything in its place because you see that, you know, this place is for everything. I mean, if it's here, it's where it should be. Uh, this whole place is where it should be. This place uh, holds all my visual references that influence me. Uh, it keeps my, it holds my photography. Uh, my modeling projects are up here. You know, when I run out of room for things, I start pinning things to the wall. Because I don't want, the things that are displayed in this room are things that I want displayed. I mean, this place for me is a gallery of ideas. It's not something that I want buried in some file cabinet somewhere. I want it out where I can see it so I can remember it. I'm a keeper of things, and, and, and all of these things that are stuck to the wall and, and, and piled on shelves and things are, are uh, the images that I have to constantly be aware of. You see, uh, it's, it's visual fabric for me. You know, I have friends that are model makers. They, are, they, they build architectural models. And what they're interested in is uh, precisely nailing down scale and dimension and the real reality of it all. But for me, I, I, strive for, I think I strive for something a little different in that I, I like to, uh, uh, my models take on a tone of, uh, of the reality as I see it, as I perceive it for me. I mean, it's an illusion, sure, but I mean, it's, it's uh, ideally the way I want it to look. What I am building is this illusion of reality, but I like to flavor it with uh, a little imagination and fantasy. It's only recently that I've become aware of how my past is influencing my modeling. I mean, my family's past and my, my past as a musician and a singer and uh, even more recently as a photographer. I mean, all of these things I'm drawing from, all of these elements, all of these uh, images, textural images I'm drawing from, and uh, I don't think it's some sort of crazy coincidence that I'm out here building these models with a railroad theme. I mean, it's, it's, it's just something that 
that had to be. Helger. One material on top, glued. Line of glue here, a bead of glue, then screwed on the top, two and one before on the bottom. This is our main support, albeit small. This illustrates what we're going to be using for our main support in bench work building. Now, the re one of the reasons that I like to use the L-girder, and there's, of course, a, a number of advantages to L-girder, but one of them is, is that if you use just the, what they call the butt joint method, or just butting up a board against a, a board like this, or one but two against the board, or wherever you use, and you run the screw through here, then consequently the weight of the screw, the, the screw takes the weight of the bench work versus like on El Girder, where the wood is placed on top, and that is your support mechanism, wood on wood, which is better. All right, now what I like to use as far as building El Girder are these tools right here. Nothing fancy, nothing expensive, uh, can be purchased at your local hardware store, but I'm gonna run through them just so you'll know what I use, you know, to build mine, and, and like I say, they're sort of old and beat up, but circular saw, and uh, this saw here is uh, good for cutting one by fours and, and two by fours and heavier members of wood you'll need and it makes the work go quicker and those of you that are a little bit afraid of circular saws you might want to try the old hand saw here and I have used the hand saw and of course it requires a little bit of elbow grease and uh, maybe a little bit more than what I like to use now when you get the members cut out you want to put them together with with screws and you're gonna to have to use two two drills to do that now the reason I like the cordless drills versus the common drill is that the cards get in the way. Uh, once I'm moving quick on bench work, I tend to start tripping over cards and things. And also, I, I drape them over finished scenery portions, and it causes damage. It makes it break trees or, or, or move things around that you don't want moved around. So get yourself, uh, if you care to, a, a set of uh, drills, and they're cordless. Now, in one drill, you'll notice I have an eighth-inch drill bit or a quarter-inch drill bit or whatever you need to use for your screws. And then in, in this drill, to drive home the screw, I have a Phillips head, and the reason I do that is that I, I use, or like to use, a drywall screw, okay? And, and it has a Phillips head on it, and this is sort of self-centering when you're under the layout and you don't want to have to see where that little slot is and the little screw. You can just put this right up there and it sort of self-centers. You can drive the screw home. Now, and these are rechargeable drills. Now, you're going to need like a third hand when you're building all this, so what I like to use are three-inch adjustable C clamps or G clamps whatever you want to use now now these you'll need a lot of I'd, I'd recommend getting a dozen of these be sure you have a lot of pencils on hand in case you break uh, you know the lead in the end you can use pencils to mark them what have you now you're going to need a lot of white glue because white glue is what really is going to be making the joints hard and fast not only just the screws themselves now two you're going to have to measure everything, so be sure that you get a tape measure that, you know, is, is long enough for the requirements that you need, and, and this here is a 12-foot tape measure. Okay, moving along. What we have now is a chalk line. This chalk line is used when you are uh, cutting things like plywood. You can stretch it out, attach it to the end, pull it taut, and snap it, and it makes a mark. Okay, and it's, and it's a lot better than trying to find a board or something long enough to make a real long mark. Now, the deal is, is that those of you that do like to use wood screws, other than the drywall screw, what I like to use is a number six, one and a half inch long wood screw. And of course, the drywall screw is one and a half inches long. You want it, you want it long enough so I can get a good bite into the board. Okay. And for that, you'll need the old slot screwdriver. And not only does the devil is a screwdriver, as a paint stirrer too, as I've used this. Okay. Now, we're going to be attaching legs because we need legs to support the bench work. In order to do that, we have carriage bolts. Carriage bolts come in a variety of lengths, and this is about a four inch length. And on the end, you will notice a wing nut. Now, the wing nut, I know you're asking yourself, why does he have a wing nut? Well, this, as it is placed through the bench work, like this, supports the leg. All I have to do is whip around with this little wing nut attach it to the end, if I can get this one started, spin it on, tighten it down, and it's there. I don't have to reach in my pocket for a wrench or look for a wrench or anything. I just use the old, old 50. Now, as we move right on down the road, you might want to, maybe you don't have the strength 
to tighten up a wing nut. So, a pair of pliers can just reach in there. Once again, you don't have to adjust it like you do a, a wrench. You can just reach in there and sort of tighten it up. Now, when we get to the, to the area of track risers and things, or even, even in the very beginning uh, stages of bench work where we attach the legs and we need to level the legs, get yourself a good level because you're going to use this throughout. Even in scenery, we're going to be using levels. So, get yourself a nice level. Now, those of you that are really, really, really into bench work, I mean, I know a guy once that painted his. Now, you might want to make sure that it's architecturally right, okay? And as you can see, I have a square that I've sort of bent on the end. So, get yourself a square and you can make sure everything, make, the, make sure the world is right, perpendicular. Also, when we are cutting the plywood, okay, this sure beats the heck out of using a keyhole saw, something like this. This is a saber saw, albeit beat up, but it is a saber saw and it does reduce the work down considerably. And when you're using all these power tools, be sure to get a set of goggles so you can become a space cadet. And also, you do not injure your eyes. At least, I don't think you'll injure your eyes with, with the goggles. And then when you have your goggles, also purchase a 35 millimeter camera because you want to save your eyes so you can later on take pictures of your progress and uh, be able to record it and maybe even get it published in the magazine. Last but not least, in our little arsenal of weapons for bench work, is the yardstick. Now this yardstick, get, get four or five of these. They're free, I think. Are they free? They're free at the, uh, at the old lumber company. Okay, they're free at the lumber company. And what I use them for is a trammel and a, and a radius uh, drawer, okay, whatever the word is there. What we do is we put a hole here and we put a hole wherever our uh, radius line is here or whatever we've determined our radius to be, say 18 inches or whatever. And, and we'll get into this later, but what we do is place it on the home assault and we draw the radius of the track. Okay, with this. And these can also be used as little paddles and all kinds of little things. Now, those of you that by now you're really getting into bench work, you know what the tools to use. And of course the man that invented the L girder mechanism is uh, Lynn Westcott. And he was once editor of Model River. And the thing is, is that there are some other specific applications of L girder that you might want to uh, uh, look into. And so what I've got this little place marked right here with this pen so we can turn right to it. And this shows you L girder as he explains it in his book. So, summarize, you might want to pick this book up just to see how it applies to your specific requirements. So why don't we get these tools gathered all up, get the table clear, and put them to work building some bench work. Have we stopped, Tate? Uh, even if we have, I want to show. I want to show you something. Can you come over here just for a second? I mean, I'm going to move this out of the way. I want to show you what Elgar is really. Uh, you know the application of it all and everything. If I can get over here, which is real difficult. This is a small module, but but you can see, and this is a small Elgar, but it still is the same thing that we've been talking about. It supports the railroad. Now this is Elgar. It supports. It has a little lip here that supports the joist. This joist here is not even at right angles, but it's where it needs to be as far as supporting this, which is our riser that supports the sub road bed right in here, and then home assaults laminated to that, and finally we, we, we are up at the track level. And the sway brace is just arbitrarily put in here just because I wanted something sturdy. But, I mean, this is no big deal. I just want to show you that this is the application of El Girder, and we'll get to building a little bit of it later on. Why don't we talk about this one by four? Now, the deal is, you know, what, one of the main things about El Girder, the strength comes from the fact that the, the wood members are set on edge like this one before, and, and that eliminates sag this way. And coupled with the fact that we are going to attach a one by two here to make our little L portion, looking at it this way, and we're going to glue it, and then we're going to take our screws and run it through there. And this attached this way keeps the warpage out from occurring this way. So, now. I know you're asking, what is the very first step? Well, here it is, white glue, you run it right down the edge, all the way down, okay? Just squiggly, put it on kind of random, you know. Squiggly lines of glue, all the way down. You know, okay, enough of the glue. Then, we position one by two on top of the one by four that has a glue on it. 
Next, we start a pilot hole, which I've already started here in this one by two because, believe it or not, this is the third day. Okay, you come in here like this. Pilot hole, don't go too far with it. Remember we talked before about these uh, Phillips head drywall screws. That's what goes in here. Then we have this drill with the Phillips head bit. Drive it home. Now what I like to do is move on down to the other end of the board and pull the end, drill the pilot hole lightly, place in one more of those little funny little screws. Do that number. And then I like to come into the middle, do it again, little pilot hole, put the drill in the hole, drive it home. Like that, okay. Now, really, once this glue sets up and everything becomes rigid, you can even remove the screws if you don't want to buy any more screws. You, see, you can use the one you've already used. All right, what we do next is we come with the one, uh, the uh, two by two legs. And what I like to do before I attach, let's start from this end down here, is measure in, say, about one foot like we've done here, see? <laughs> on the previous take, we had a hole right here. Well, we're gonna have to make another hole because we didn't get it right, so we're gonna mark it in about one foot right there, okay? Attach the leg. And remember, we talked about C-clamps. C-clamps are gonna hold this in position. Okay, sort of like that. Now, I'm gonna turn this around so the camera can pick up what we're gonna do, set it down here. Now, the next step is to go back to the drill, remove the small drill bit that you're using to make pilot holes with, and put in a larger drill bit, in this case a quarter inch drill bit, tighten her down, get over here, and drill your pilot hole your, for your leg. There you go. And of course, when you've gone through your floor into your den, you know you've drilled far enough. Now you put this down. And if the camera can see this, we're gonna put this carriage bolt in here, thusly. Now see this carriage bolt has this sort of a, a hex head here on the interior portion. And I wanna drive that into the wood so when I begin tightening down on the carriage bolt, that will stop the rotation. So we tap it in with a hammer, like that. We turn it over, put the washer here, come back with a carriage, I mean a wing, wing nut, start it there, tighten it down, and you can just hand tighten it. Now, you may want to snug it up. Sometimes I wait till all the legs are on to do that, but you want to snug it up. And to do that, we have to have a pair, have you seen the plier? And, uh, see, the crew knows where the pliers are. And you come back here, snug it up. Now, you don't have to worry at this point about this leg being square to this or perpendicular or, or straight or anything, because we're gonna level everything up once we get the, the, the bench work to a state that we can do that. So now, why don't we build the other L girder and start attaching the legs and diagonals and just sort of work ourselves around the table and we'll have a section of El Girder about four foot long. Okay, now, a minute ago we built this particular section of El Girder and attached the leg, and as you can see, through the miracle of time and TV, we have dissolved around and made uh, all of the legs and I've attached them to, in fact, another L girder that we built because as you see, it takes two L girders to make the thing whole. Now also we have attached these diagonals and they are integral to the support system, especially when you have L girder that would be made maybe in the area of 13 or 14 foot span, these diagonals help, help support. Now, what I wanna do 
is fasten this last gusset plate. Now the gusset plate is important because it does two things. One, it uh, sort of helps in the appearance, and two, it strengthens this area with the leg. Now before I drive home the last screw, I always like to check and make sure the legs are level, which in fact they are. I like my models to lean a little bit, but not the bench work that supports the model, so we level it up. Now, come in here and drive this final screw. Drive it home. Now, one of the major <coughs> attributes to L girder besides the simplicity of its construction, uh, the lack of expensive cost, is the fact that we do incur this little lip situation here. Okay? Now, as you, as you can see, with this lip like it is, and, and, and I want to stress to you, a lot of people when they're building L girder, sometimes they, they have the lip on the outside, but I like mine on the inside because it works better for me. I haven't really determined why. It, I just like it that way. But anyway, uh, as you can see, I've attached these joists through here. Forget about the risers. The risers are visible at this particular portion of the construction, but we're going to talk about that later. Now, the joist sits on top, and that's why I like L girder, is that the wood here supports the wood here, okay? So why don't we go ahead and attach this final joist member. And I also want to point out to you that the screws are driven from below. And, and another uh, uh, reason that that's nice is that once these joists are in fact in position, the track is laid, and the scenery is piled on top, if the screws that support the joists were, were in fact driven from above, then we would have trouble in relocating joists later on. So we're going to put all the screws in from below, or, or the joist screws in from below. So why don't we uh, go ahead and attach this final joist here. All right, now, I'm going to go ahead and drive these final screws home here to support this joist and get this final screw. One thing I want to point out to you, too, is that when you're working underneath the table and you're searching and groping around for screws and what have you, using this Phillips head on the, on the old uh, cordless drill, which I stressed a while ago, you can place your Phillips head screw on the drill bit itself or on the, the, on the, the Phillips head screwdriver and just sort of position your screw that way and sometimes it serves as a little extension of your hand. All right, now we have our uh, joist in position, and, and one, one thing I'd like to point out to you while we're talking about joist is that uh, the joists are in fact what I term sea level, okay? Sea level being this is the bottom area, or this is the, the zero where we start from as far as building up or down from our landscape, from our base to, to achieving landscape. Now, the joist, as you see, stick out past the L girder here, and in some cases, like when I'm building L girder down on my, in my train room, they may stick out two or three feet because I don't worry about it until I have all the track in. And once the track is in, you'll have these sweeping curves and S curves, and, and, and then you can come back and cut these uh, joist members off with a saber saw, and you cut the, cut the uh, members off sort of to follow the line of the trackage and the scenery. And, and that way we can achieve sort of an aesthetic sense to the whole benchwork L girder landscape situation and uh, by the mere fact that we're introducing curves into the edge of the layout, gently uh, uh, flowing curves, it, it becomes, it adds depth, is what I'm trying to say, to the layout, because when the viewer walks into your room, he sees the curving uh, edge, and it, and it just adds a, a sense of depth. Now, to summarize on this section that we've done here, we've built the L girder bench work, we've added our diagonals, we have our uh, uh, gusset plates down here secure, our wing nuts are in, so we can remove all of our C-clamps and hope that this little thing won't collapse on us and we can go get the saws out and start cutting out some sub-road bed out of half-inch plywood. You know, my grandmother used to come over and pick me up and we would go down to the Union Terminal downtown Dallas to pick up my grandfather, who worked down there on the railroads, and uh, they would take me over to see these huge steam engines. Of course, at that time, they were phasing out steam and they were bringing in the diesels, but still, here were these monsters, you know, breathing the steam and, and, and it was these funny smells of coal and all that. I would sort of get 
terrified at the fact of being uh, around those things. And uh, I find it interesting and ironic now that instead of these big steam engines frightening me, they fascinate me. You know, really building a model railroad is, uh, you have to study your history lesson too, but we're ready now to start marking our track plan. I've sort of penciled in a little light track plan here, going by what we have here, and I'm going to transfer it a little heavier so I can have something to really look at when I get my saber saw out, because when the sawdust starts getting on the plywood, it becomes hard to see, so I take a marks a lot, draw it down. Now, that, this really is the only critical edge because it's going against the rear. Everything else is sort of free form, okay? I just sort of drew it in here free form, so I'm gonna just start over here and just sort of pencil it in, making these curves, because I sort of know what I want to do with the track here. Okay? And I'm just following these previously made pencil marks. Okay, now these little circles here are where we're gonna use the uh, yardstick as a trammel radius to draw a radius, okay? Make these marks in here. Now, the deal is, is the way that we determine this spacing here for this sub road bed is that I follow along my little track center line here, which, is, which was previously lightly penciled in. And the way that I got this track center line is with this trammel here, and, and I drilled a hole here drill the hole here. Now this is an 18 inch radius curve. So my track center line goes like this. I place a little uh, screw in the end of here and I put my pencil in here and I simply drew following along here like this see, to determine this, determine this track center line. Now the same thing with this curve over here. My center point was here and this is a little tighter radius curve. I think it was about a 14 inch radius curve but this is a long E line. For all you people that want to know about tight radius, this is logging, so we don't need large radius curves. Anyway, just swung right on in here. Once again, I use this, this uh, yardstick device as a trammel. Now, say, for example, that you had, let's turn it around this way, a curve, a curved section, say like this right here, and you want to take it into a straight section. Well, what to do there, is measure about an eighth of an inch from the end of the curve section here, make you a mark right there, draw your straight track in here like so, okay? Now what this allows us to do is make an easement between the tangent track and the curve track, and we can talk about graduating spirals and all that, but what really happens here is that you just simply freehand this situation in here, okay, like this. And what happens there is we have a nice easement curve to take our curved trackage right on into our straight trackage, and we don't have any problems with that jerky motion that's so common with model railroads, okay? Now, another thing that I want to touch on too is, is, is one of the reasons that I, I model a lot of narrow gauge is because I can get these types of curves worked into the layout quicker because because the curvature of, of my trackage uh, is is tighter because the trains I run are smaller. Consequently, I, I, I can run tighter radius curves. Now we can look in this book, this old South Park book, for example. Okay, and I'll thumb through the pages here, and the reason that that is is because back in the 1800s when they were laying out the track grades, the track gangs followed the river courses. The locating engineers just used the river courses that ran up through the mountains and actually just laid the track right in there. And I even have another picture. Now here is a uh, South Park engine steaming up the canyon here, if I can hold this steady enough. And it's following the river courses. Well, consequently, to follow the river courses, uh, there's, there's gonna be, as the river turns and twists and curves and wraps itself around mountains and rocks, the trackage has to follow that. So that is really one of the charms that, that leads me into narrow gauge modeling, 
and, and I'm not really making a plug for narrow gauge. I'm just saying for my my uh, own uh, uh, modeling desire, narrow gauge fits the bill for me. Okay. So now, what we want to do is get the saber saw out, and we're going to cut this out, and then we're going to attach it to the risers, and we're going to talk about joists and risers a little further, and we'll bring the table back in. And I want to remind you that when you begin cutting on, on half-inch plywood or anything that requires the use of a power saw, you know, get the old goggles on. So why don't we set up and do that, and I'll get the saw out. All right, we're going to cut this out now, and, and, and for that, I have what you need to get, what every young boy and girl should have, is a set of goggles, which magically transform me into Captain Sabres. Captain Weirdo. Captain Weirdo. Now, in <laughs> take one, we made this little mark. Take two, we're going to sort of slip this right on in here and dig in. Homosoat. Okay, now this homosote is a pressed paper product that is actually going to be the finished road bed piece. Now we cut out that plywood section a minute ago as per the plan, and they almost match. But we'll lay this over here and we'll turn this around. Now somebody made mention, I think it was you, the crew member, made mention that why didn't we lay this over here and cut it this way because we would have saved material. Well. I don't want to do that. I don't want to save material. No, I do want to save material, but the thing is, is that if we do it this way, this dis discarded piece later is not going to actually be discarded, but it's going to be utilized as our river bottom on the plywood section. And we may even put this homosote. See, now this homosote is good because it, it not only holds our trackage, but it also gives us a base work for our towns and other areas. What I want to do now is I want to use our plywood that we just cut out previously, subroad bed, as a template to draw onto the homosote. Okay. Now this homosote is somewhat hard to find. What you need to do is just get in the yellow pages of the phone book and start calling building supply dealers and uh, do a little research. And if you're in a small town, you'll probably have to order it out of some larger area. But uh, and, and and you know, the thing is, is that we've even tried other materials, but this seems to work the best. So if you can hang in there and try to find homosote, that's the way to go. Okay. Let me get over here where I can, I want to get a better shot at putting these lines on here. Okay, now what we would do next is we would put the goggles on, become Captain Sabersaw one more time, and we would cut this out. But to speed up the works a little bit, I have already cut it out. And it sort of fits right in there. Now this is the finished homosote piece that we've cut out. When we get back to the table, to the El Girder table, we will uh, attach our subroad bed, okay? And then to the top of that, we will laminate later on. Once the subroad bed is securely attached to the risers, we will come back and laminate with white glue and some brads the homosote to the top of that, and then we can start begin, begin to start laying our track. Okay, so why don't we uh, get out of this and go set up on the bench work and start uh, securing the sub road bed to the, to the uh, risers. Now what I'm doing here is I'm leveling up on top of these risers, this little one by two section, simply because as we look at the sub road bed that we previously cut, as it sits on top of the, the now finished El Girder framework, we can determine that this expanse of plywood here needs to be supported by, mere, by more than just mere risers. So what I've done is sort of extend the riser technology here, if you will, to include these one by twos, and they're easier to level rather than trying to, to level random risers, okay? Now, we want to place this on here and really just eyeball it in to our marks to make sure this is sitting on the situation right. Now, as you can see, this, this sub-road bed starts angling on down. I've predetermined the elevation. Now, how did I do that? Okay, I can tell you that, uh, say, for example, a one-inch rise in 100 inches is a 1% grade. Two inches in 100 is a 2% and so on. So I had figured out my grade by using that formula. 
And what we're going to do now is we're going to clamp on this final riser and secure the sub road bed to the final riser. Okay, in this sort of predetermined location. Okay. Reach for the drills. Make the pilot holes. wood crack, reach around, get another screw, come back around here, place it in, all right, now what we want to do is remove the C-clamp and make sure everything is one more time sitting square, and it is, nothing has moved. We want to secure sub road bed to the risers. Now, this one by two just requires one screw. Little pilot hole. Once again, reach into the old sack of screws. Drill it home. I'm going to set these screws up here so I can get to everything. Put a few out. Now, you'll have to sort of get under here and eyeball down where this, uh, where everything lines up. Once you've got this screw in, you can sort of move on down with a couple of more pilot holes. Okay, and I just moved my board, but I can realign it. Okay. Now let's go ahead and Secure this and secure that. Two screws. Go ahead and put this screw in. All right, let's put some in the end. Get these screws out of the way over here. One here, one here. Man, I love these screws. I tell you, drywall screws, they really work. They sort of just pull themselves right in. You don't need to countersink anything. All right, now, what we have here, and before I finish, I better put one in here. We are uh, getting close to the time when we're going to attach our homosote. All right, remove the drills. Now, we have the secure base. We have the L-girder. We have all the diagonals in. We have the sub-road bed attached to uh, all of the risers in this situation. We come back with this. Now, this is our homosote, and how are we going to secure this? Well, what I like to use is just plain old white glue and brads. And what I'm going to do is remove this for a minute and just start applying glue in sort of squiggly, wavy lines all the way around, okay? At least on the edges. Run it on down the uh, road bed. When you get to the road bed that's narrow like this, you can just put it in the center. Okay. Run it on over here. Right on around. And just sort of crisscross it inside. Now we're going to put some brads to hold this down. Okay. Put the uh, homosote sort of position it down, lay it, and sort of line it up. 
everywhere, okay? Just like that. Now, what I like to use are three quarter inch wire brads, and I just sort of tap them in here at, at, at you know, random locations, sort of hold this in place while the glue sets. Because once the glue's dry, we don't have to worry about anything moving around too much. So let's just drive a few in here, here and there. And one thing, when you, when you drive these brads in, make sure that you don't, you know, <laughs> pound it in. Don't use a lot of muscle because we don't want big craters in the town site where we're going to lay our track. Consequently, the trains would derail. So just barely, uh, when you feel it hit the wood, just sort of take it to the surface, and that's as far as you need to go with that, okay? Now, you're going to have to go all the way around on some of this, making sure that it's laying down in the areas that you want it to. And I see it started to rise up here a little bit, so we want to go over here. Just tap this down. Okay. just bent a nail. I bent a nail. That's okay. We'll cover it up with scenery. All right. I think we've got enough brads in here. Something else. Now, you know, when we cut that plywood a while ago, the piece that I talked about that we were discarding but not really discarding is our river bottom. Now, the river bottom, I, I've cut these notches out so they'll clear the risers. I'm just going to walk over here and sort of drop in here and show you that if we wanted to, in fact, add a riverway here just for aesthetic purposes, because the track, remember I told you, it likes to run by the river courses. So we can position this in here, our discarded piece, somewhat like that. And uh, we would probably come in here and notch this even further. But what I'm, I'm trying to say here is that later on scenically, we might want to, as a matter of fact, take this section out and possibly build a trestle in here because with, it, with, with the trackage running into the town site, now I'm talking about composition now, but we, we want to think about composition as we're building all this stuff because uh, ultimately we want to get to the final thing and that is the total layout and, and the way it looks. So let's think about bridges. Now, now you know, you might want to drop this out, put in maybe a plate girder bridge or, or a wooden trestle that when the viewer comes in the room, he, he sees the trestle on the train running over, it sort of draws him into the town area, and it, and it all sort of blends together and looks real nice. Now, uh, we have our base to work from to, to begin track laying, so why don't we uh, gather up some track components? And, and basically what I'm going to talk about is flex track, and, and there are other ways to lay track, like hand laying track and things of that nature, but what we're going to talk about is flex track, so why don't we get some sections out, take a look at it, and see what we can do with... Uh, the track laying procedure on the homosote. Now, before we actually get to track laying, what I like to do is sort of trace around my turnouts that I'm going to be using. And this is a number four, and this is a narrow gauge turnout. But it sort of gives me positioning on the homosote so I don't have to <coughs> fumble around trying to find locations later on. And of course, we've already found our center line here, our track center line. And we'll uh, get into track laying now. The tools that you're going to need to do this, you're going to need some, some cutoffs similar to this, wire cutoffs. You're going to need some needle nose pliers. And you're probably going to need just an X-Acto knife with a number 11 blade or something similar. Of course, a trusty pencil just to mark, you know, make correct marks and things. Hopefully they're going to be correct. And map pens. Okay, you want to get an assortment of map pens. And some of you might want to use track spikes, and I have a whole uh, plastic container full of little track spikes that we'll talk about a little later on. One of the most important things is you want to get a three-point track gauge, okay? And we're probably going to have to have, uh, really for this, this tape, I tried to find some, uh, some what they call rail nippers to, to cut the track, but I couldn't locate any, so what I'm going to use is a Dremel tool, and you'll notice on the end of this Dremel tool, 
I have this cutoff disc. It's an abrasive disc that just really sort of eats right through metal. And so when you use that to trim your track ends, you want to be sure and wear a pair of goggles because it throws up little bits of, and pieces of metal. And you're going to need a drill because we're going to come back and drill holes in the road bed to run our feeder wires through. Okay. And if I've left out anything, well, you might want a, a, a little uh, small hand drill like this in case you need to make holes in the, in, the, uh, in the ties, the plastic ties or what have you. And you're going to need a soldering gun. <laughs> Somebody stuck a tree in the old solder. Uh, you're going to need some solder. Now, this is a point I want to bring up. D do not get acid core solder because eventually it will corrode the track and nothing will run. Be sure that you get uh, rosin core, and, and hopefully it'll say that on the label, rosin core solder. Okay, and what makes uh, the solder flow a little better is a real funky can of solder paste. And make sure there's little things sticking in it, you know, and that'll help the solder. Okay, now what I want to do is talk about the flex track. What, that's what we're going to use. There, there, there's really two, two far, there's three forms of track. There's flex track, hand laid track, and sectional track. Sectional track is what comes in uh, beginner's railroad kits. Um, hand laid track is for people that are experienced in that situation. And I must tell you that on my home layout, the real Chama, there's a whole lot of hand laid track, but it can make for a whole lot of problems later on, especially in Texas where the heat is really intense in the summer and it caused rail expansion, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm thinking that the best way to go here that I found is flex track. Now, flex track like this piece of Shinohara flex track by Lambert is uh, nickel silver rail, which has good conductivity. And on the back side, you'll notice where the plastic tie strip is, it has these little gaps cut. That's so you can bend it into these crazy S curves like I, I like to use. Now, the first thing I do is I lay it out here and I sort of get my curves situated, okay? And I know about just about where I want to put it because I'm following my track center lines. Now you'll notice on this end, in order to match up here, we're going to have to trim some rail. See, because it's just not going to work. So in order to do that, I have to put on the goggles to keep things from flying into my eye. Okay. And we fire up the Dremel tool. Now I've determined that the little mark, I've made a little mark right here with a little file. Cut off the ends. Turn off the Dremel tool. Now, you can remove the goggles. And I just wanted to show cutting that in. Actually, I've got this in here trimmed and ready to go. And what I did is uh, I went and got some Railcraft purchased. I didn't got, I purchased. Some Railcraft rail joiners. Can we get a shot of that right there? These are rail joiners. These will fit on the ends to join the ends. And why don't we do that right now? And they just sort of slip on like this. And sometimes, they can be a real bear to get on, you know, you have to sort of wrestle with them. Now, what I like to do is go ahead and fit this on here temporarily. I mean, it's not real crucial. We don't have to join the ends yet. Let's go ahead and figure out, because as we draw this into a curve, the, the track ends are gonna, gonna slip and slide around. Take your map pins, position the map pins to hold the track in alignment, okay? sort of loosely because we're going to come back and glue the track down. I'm just getting a, a, a sort of a loose situation going here. I like situations that are real loose. Okay, now let's see if we can get this to where it works right. Situate that in there. Maybe put a map pin right here. Now, now that we've got this switch, I've just been handed the news. These aren't map pins. These are push pins. Map pins have a little, you know, round deal on the top. Do not get confused with it. All right. <laughs> now, we want to continue on with this deal here. The thing is, is that we've got our track connected here with metal rail joiners. Later on, we're going to have to 
put some insulated uh, rail jars on this end for electrical problems that we might have because these are what is called solid rail frogs. That means that the later on when we go to wire this thing, the electricity is flowing through the rail at all times. I mean, it's not like there's a gap cut underneath the plastic or anything. So we provide the gaps with these little doodads here, which are specifically made for that purpose, and they fit on the ends here of the rail. And, and we can talk about the gap feeder rule a little, a little later on when we get into wiring. But anyway, we're ready to solder this. Now, the thing to do, what I like to do, I don't really like to do this, but I'm going to do it. Just take a little solder paste. You want to you want to apply this to the outside of the rail. Don't put it on the inside. It just creates a mess. It's too much to clean up. Put it on the outside. Not a whole lot because you just want it to flow. Heat up the soldering gun. I normally have someone that heats my soldering guns for me, but he couldn't make it today, so I'll have to do that task. So take the old solder, rosin core. Make sure it's rosin core. Make sure you tin the end of the solder. And we don't want to use a lot of solder. We don't want to tin the end. We just want to take and, and just flow it on just a little bit. Okay. And it just makes for a cleaner uh, situation later on. Uh, cleaner bond. Okay, now you move the soldering and put the... I don't like... A lot of people say heat the track up, but I like to get the solder, solder uh, tip real good and hot and just touch it to the rail because uh, I don't like to linger in there because we could sort of melt the ties, you know? So what we want to do is just get some solder on here and watch this. It'll flow. When it goes, you know something's happening. There it is, real quick. Bring the soldering down, the gun down, the tip. Listen for the little crackle, make sure it's flowing. Get in and get out, okay? Now, I want to stress to you that this joint is not perfect, but it's okay. I mean, there's a little gap right here, but that's not going to bother us as long as they're not too wide. And another thing, too, is make sure you don't have kinks, okay? When you, when you go to join this track, make sure it's not laying off at right angles or something like that because it definitely will derail the cars. Now, we want to clean up the joint just a little bit. Just hit it with a little, a few sharp strokes of the file because, see, we did get solder on the top of the rail. You don't want to leave that. So what I like to do is just sort of file that off like that. Later on, we'll come back and, and see, we're going to lay glue in here and glue the rail down and all that kind of stuff and ballast and everything. And, and, and usually, you want to clean the track up. And later on, we'll come back with the bright boy and hit it a couple of times on the rail to knock off the glue and what have you that gets on the rail. Now, <clears throat> the next step, and, and you know, I know you're asking out there, will these big pins be there? Well, not for long because they're just for positioning. What I want to do now is we're going to remove the pins and we're going to spread some just some white glue and some people use matte medium uh, to, to glue their track down. But what I'm going to do is remove the matte pins because I sort of have this solder. I don't have to worry about this joint so much. I'll kind of keep it in location, keep maybe one matte pin in down at the end there. We take white glue, clean the end out. And I like to just form a squiggly line right on down the old road bed. Now leave a little bit on the end because, I mean, don't, don't, don't take the glue all the way to the end because you're going to have to join the next piece of rail and you don't want it glued flat where you have to lift it up, and, you know. And so just spread this out with your finger, finger as they say in Texas. Spread it out, come back and start positioning this back where you had it. I mean, it doesn't have to be perfect, just as long as it sort of follows the center line. Okay, put your mat pins back in. What did I do with all the mat pins? Bring it around. Another mat pin. Swing this little deal back over here. Now, in the area of the turnout right here, you don't want to apply glue here where these points are because this little throw bar has got to move. And then when you come to ballast it, a good idea what I do, and I don't know if anybody else does this, but I take WD-40 or some sort of a real uh, thin viscosity oil, oil, and spray it in here before you start gluing any scenery around so this will stay uh, loose and, and you can you know, be able to move it because these points have got to be thrown. Now, 
But I do glue, uh, put glue in the end here, and I just squirt a little bit up underneath here, like so, and work it in, okay? This is a messy process, so you might want to wear a wife's apron. Now, occasionally I'll come in with a little spike or what have you. Now, the thing is, is that a lot of people come back and they, the reason that I don't spike the rail, most everyone uses this. These are spikes. The reason is it, it takes too long. I mean, you have to go along hunting for the little holes and stuff. And I like to keep moving and keep rolling and moving quick. So I just use mat pins because the glue will serve to hold the track. And then once the ballast is in position and we come back with our um, uh, glue water mixture, half and half, and squirt it along there and then a little uh, granules of ballast, it's, it's going to bond it in place. Everything will be, you know, rigid and, and, and ready for the trains to roll. So don't worry about, about that deal. One thing I'd like to talk about, though, is you notice these points, as they move, let me get something that I can point with. There's a little brad that goes through the metal area here into the tie that secures it. Now, now what, this is a Lambert turnout. Now, what they've done, they've, they've added a little plate under here for electrical continuity. And what happens over, you know, the uh, 55 years or so that your layout is in existence, dirt works its way up under the rails here, or plaster, or scenery, or, or whatever, scenery materials, and it makes for bad continuity of electricity in this one area. Now, what I like to do is I come in here on the outside of the rail of the points, right here, and I solder a very, very thin, one-strand little, little thin wire between here and between here, so when these are thrown, it is not a very rigid wire and it will be pliable enough to move with the points. That way we'll continue to have continuity of electricity through the frog. Now, one thing I'd like to uh, mention too is that when we were trimming the, the uh, rail here, we had to cut away this plastic tie strip. Now, the way that, that that can be done is you can just lay this on some surface like this, take an X-Acto knife with a number 11 blade, just push down like that, pow, it flies right off, okay? Now, another thing too is that if you can find the tie that just flew right off, you can come back up here, if I can make room, and you can trim here and trim, trim this, 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 these little nubs off and stuff and trim it and get it to look like a real tie. And then you can slip it under, right up under here like this, you know, later on, once it's trimmed, it's not trimmed now, but you slip it under there and it completes this tie area right in here. And it looks real good and look real finished. Now, one thing I'd like to mention to you is what we've used here is Shinohara track and it's a real good brand of flex track, but, but in, in the type of modeling I do, where everything is sort of fine scale, I like to go in a, a little smaller rail. Now this is a section of rail that I, that I prefer to use now, if we can get a good shot of that. This is Code 40 flex track by Railcraft. And just in narrow gauge, it works real well because the spikes are almost scale, okay? Now the reason that I went and switched to flex track versus hand laid track is simply because in hand laid track, you remember a while ago when we had the picture of the spikes here, the, these big spikes loom very, very large in a photograph and when I'm trying to get, get my trains and my, the, the whole attitude of the surroundings to look in scale, you, you know, taking a picture of hand laid track with these grossly large spikes just doesn't work. So anyway, I've gone to this smaller rail, smaller spike heads and it's flex track. Now, why don't we clean this up with a little Bright Boy? This Bright Boy can be purchased at the hobby store. Yeah, see, the glue is already starting to set. We'll move right along. I just want to test this joint out before I go further. The thing is, is what you want to do is test these joints out with one of your cars or a pair of trucks or whatever. And I happen to have a car. Okay, I have this car. Now, it's... <laughs> Looking at this car, it may be questionable that this thing would run on any piece of track. But I like them weathered. Why don't we just fit the wheels on here? And start to push it along and make sure. And as you can see, it does go over the switch and it goes over the joint. So we have successfully, as I did with my hand, derail it. Let's try that again. Now, 
with this car, just shove it along the track and make sure that there's no serious bumps or anything. And as we look, we test the track, it runs real good and rolls real free and everything. So the joint is acceptable. Now, we want to be able to attach feeder wires and feeder wires are wires that give us electrical contact to the rail and solder those to the rail. So we have to make drill holes to, to run the wires. We don't want to push too hard on the drill because it may hit the rail. And I hope I didn't hit it, but I don't think I did. All right. Let's do it on both sides like that. Now we take our wire here, and this is about a number 18 gauge wire. This is where our little cutoffs come in, cut off a section, cut off another section. Strip the ends. Strip this in. Now, I want to show you a little trick here. When you run this through, get your needle nose pliers, and you want this to lay flat against the rail. So what I normally do, I bend it over once, like that, make that bend. Then I come back and I make this bend, like that. Okay, then when you pull it down, it will pull tight and lay right up against the rail. Except that I have a little nub right there, but that's all right. See, it's laying right up against the rail. Now we're just gonna do one of these for the sake of time. Then you come back with your solder paste, dab on a little gunk right there, solder paste. Heat up the soldering gun again. And hope that it does heat up, and hope that you have it plugged in. Look for your solder right here. Tin the edge one more time, like I'm doing here. Give it a second to flow. Now, you want to make real sure that you get a good, real shiny silvery joint right here because this is where your, your, your wires come in, I mean, your electricity is coming in. See how that flows? And hold it on there. If it melts the tie a little bit, that's all right. It's not going to create a whole lot of problems. Now, you can see where this solder is sort of climbed up on the rail there, and we're going to have to knock that off with a file again. Just take it down to the level of the rail. Come back and hit it with the bright boy. And that's it. Now, after this is set up real nice and dry and the glue is rigid and everything is in position, we could come back and sometimes what I like to do is take a uh, paintbrush with various co earth tone colors and randomly paint the ties. And then I come back with an overspray of uh, Pactra Light Earth just to weather this up and get away from the sameness of color on these ties. And because the, I look at, at, at track laying and things like this is really scenery too, because it, it, it uh, contributes to the overall effect. Now, we've got the track laid. Later on, we can look at uh, ballasting the track, but I normally ballast the track when I'm doing scenery because I like to blend it all in and make it look you know, right all through the scene. So why don't we take, what we've got here is we've got the bench work, we've got the homosote laid. Uh, later on, if I was, I was working on down in this area, I'd run a track over to an industry here and maybe curve a track around to where it would go off the edge here and join into our next module. But this is the basics of track laying, and of course you can connect a switch machine under here or a ground throw, and this little item right here is a Caboose Hobbies ground throw. I spike it on either end and it has a little physical connection there that goes through this little hole right here, and it will throw the points manually, and it's, it's a nice way to go. <clears throat> now, I think we've covered just about everything as far as uh, the basics of bench work, construction, L girder, risers, joists, homosote, subroad bed, uh, laying flex track. One thing I'd like to mention about flex track, too, is that uh, when you, when you uh, get into a, a radius situation, say, a 24-inch radius curve or something like that, where you have to actually use more trackage than what's available in this one three-foot section of track, and you have to join the ends. Make sure you do that in a long straight section. Just solder the ends together, then bend the track, because it just, you know, it eliminates that kink that might occur if you just join it together with the joiners and then solder it. 
another thing too is that uh, uh, you want to make sure that you always check for kinks in your track when you're hand landing or when you're laying flex track. I guess we've covered just about everything. There. Well, not everything because we have a late breaking news flash. That old gap feeder rule, it's back again. I tell you what, the gap feeder rule means simply this. The wires that I've attached here are the feeder wires that bring electrical power to the rail. And, and the reason I put it in this location wasn't that I, I just arbitrarily chose it. It was because I wanted to be in front of the points. Remember that, the electricity flows in front of the points. Now the gaps, on the other hand, we want to put behind the frog. And there's exceptions to the rule, but for right now, just remember, for simplicity's sake, it will work that way, okay? Now why don't we go downstairs and take a look at what I've already done on the Rio Chama in regards to this and see how really that this applies to what we have done on the Rio Chama. Watch your step. Now, when we get in here, you can see that we really do have real live, honest to goodness, bench work built in the Rio Chama too. Now, the thing about this bench work is, is that I have designed the bench work sort of following the ideas of what I want to do scenically. One thing we did here, you see in my bench work here, which is different from what we built upstairs, is that the support mechanism goes all the way down to the floor because I want to add scenery, much as we did right here, see, which sort of lends itself to a lot of drama and uh, gives that real narrow gauge feel, Colorado feel. Okay, also, as you look through the bench work here, you can see that the road bed's in and the trackage is in, and I've used flex track in here. And also, I came back here and we put in this real long uh, bridge because I wanted to break up this long tangent track in here. We're going to have a river later on in here and some creeks and things and all kinds of neat little stuff. But what we've done here is we've sort of uh, drawn ourselves a S-curve trackage-wise and layout-wise here. And S-curves are real neat. I mean, if you can work S-curves into your trackage, that will give you added depth because the viewer comes in, his eye is drawn along the S-curve, and it makes the whole thing seem larger. Also, the reason that, you know, I had a friend come over the other day, and he's building a layout, and he said, well, man, you know, you could have you built your bench work against the wall over here and probably gotten in a lot more trackage. Well, I don't want a lot more trackage, you see. And in, in some respects, this layout has too much trackage. What I'm looking for is a happy blend between the trackage ratio versus the scenery ratio, so one doesn't overpower the other. If, if it does, I'd, let it, I'd like the scenery to overpower, which it does, hopefully. So, uh, you know, as we came in the room here, another thing, too, is that you saw the expanse of the whole layout. You know, in one fatal swoop, you see what's been done here. Well, I don't like that. So what I'm going to do to make my layout seem larger, seem, seem more busy as far as, you know, little intricate scenes everywhere, is that I'm going to construct a mountain here that will go up and encompass, go up over the track. There'll be a little tunnel through here. That's just solely for the viewer when he comes in the room, he has to peer around the mountain to see the rest of the layout. See, I like that idea of having to look around things to see little things and stuff. So the layout then becomes a series of vignettes. And psychologically, I can tell you that that will increase the area, you know, for the viewer when he sees your layout. Also, in here, you don't see a lot of wires running through here because I'm on the command control system, which means that all I do is string two bus wires. I use just lamp cord cable, like you run to a lamp or something, or extension cord wire. Run it through there. I run my positive and negative feeders down, you know, drill holes, solder the, the feeders on, run them down, tie them to the bus wires. And what happens here is that this is all one large block electrically, electric block. The whole layout is one large block. It's wired to uh, my command control system over on the shelf over there because everything is, like I say, command control and runs on a frequency of its own. So each engine is tuned to its own uh, specific receiver. So I don't have to worry about wires and everything. So you might want to explore that possibility when you get ready to wire your layout. Another plus to that is that we don't have what I consider unsightly uh, control panels dangling over the edges of our scenery and stuff, which, you know, an illusion of, of, of like I like to take pictures of mine and create illusion of realism and things like that. And, and when you have all these buttons and controls sticking through there, it looks more like a, a rocket ship than a railroad. Now, uh, I, you know, to summarize here, what I want to stress to you and what I've tried to stress through the whole tape is that be thinking scenery and three-dimensional form, shape, and function while you're creating your bench work. 
because the bench work just serves the purpose of supporting everything else we're going to put on top of it or below it. Okay? And in this case, we're going to have some waterfalls coming down through here. And in, in our next tape, we're going to have uh, uh, a town in here. We're going to have some mountains over here. The scenery is going to flow on around here. And we're just going to sort of take this right on around and become one large aesthetic whole piece of model railroad. So when the viewer walks in the room, it is united. Uh, so we've done our bench work. We've laid our track. We've studied soldering. We've studied, uh, I hope I've, I've enlightened some of you into the compositional ideas that you can use with view blocks, mirrors we're going to touch on in the next tape. And, we're, and as a matter of fact, when this view block is put in here, we're going to have a mirror back over here that will reflect this mountain over there and things like that that we can get into in our next tape. So what you want to do is go ahead and get yourself some lumber and uh, get some screws and nails and things like that and get, better, get busy building uh, your layout. Have fun with bench work. And then when you get to this stage, why well, you'll be ready for our next tape when we're going to start clothing all this skeleton and bringing our scenery down through here like I talked about a minute ago and make it into a little miniature world. And it'll be fun. So join us for our next trip to Rio Chamath. Ha, 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 ha!